You know what I like about bass fishing in the summer? The challenge. There's just so much going on in the lake, so many places where the bass could be active. Summer conditions really force me to sharpen up my technique and thought patterns. This is when you really build your versatility as an angler. Hey, by watching this mastery program and using your guidebook, I can promise you you're gonna have more fun summer bass fishing than ever before. Mainly because you're gonna be catching more bass under a wide variety of conditions. But more importantly, you're gonna know why you're catching those fish. You're definitely gonna learn to improve your fishing skills. In this program, we're gonna be applying the in-fisherman mastery system of fishing. The system that we defined earlier in this mastery series. Our formula for success has three variables. First, you have to know how to locate the fish. Secondly, an understanding of how the fish are behaving in a given environment is important. And third, making the right presentation for the conditions you're faced with. Put them all together and you're gonna be successful. As far as bass fishing goes, the most important thing you have to understand is that the fish make seasonal movements. They're not always in the same place all times of the year. The seasonal movement is important to successful bass fishing. Secondly, bass love to relate to edges. In summer time like this, there's a lot of different edge effects that the largemouth bass will use. These edges can determine the fish's overall mood, and mood can determine the strike zone. In choosing lures, as far as bass fishing goes, you want to pick a bait that you can always fish fast and efficiently. The object is to fish the most active bass and stay on them for the longest period of time. In this program, you'll learn how each one of those basic principles applies to summertime bass fishing in natural lakes. We're gonna show you how to find bass, how to understand their behavioral patterns, and we're gonna show you how to choose the right lures for the conditions you're faced with. But I gotta be honest with you. This information can make you a danger to the bass fisheries. No, you can't fish a lake out but fishing pressure can destroy the population balance that makes it a good fishing lake. To preserve our fisheries, especially in the cold lakes in the northern part of the country, I strongly recommend that you practice catch and release. Whoa. Hey, now let's fill in that first variable in our formula for success. That's location. Obviously, you gotta find fish before you can catch them. And in summer, that can be quite a challenging task. In this chapter, Al will show you the key locations in a natural lake that attract bass during the summer. Put yourself in a bass's place. It's summer now and a living is easy. You don't have to move around much. All you need to find is a good edge and something will come along for you to ambush. Your daily activities fall into a very stable pattern because your environment is stable. But if something comes along to disrupt that comfortable scene, you put your nose in the weeds and wait it out. And remember, you don't really choose to do any of these things. You do what you have to do because that's what nature has programmed you to do. If I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. I never had a strike all day. The bass outsmarted me again. Well, that really isn't true. Bass don't think and analyze situations like you and I do. They simply respond to the environment they live in. And that's usually based on local weather and water conditions. Because of electronical tagging studies on bass in natural lakes like this all over the country, we know what those bass are doing most of the time. Any natural temperate zone lake goes through tremendous seasonal changes as it warms up in spring, reaches a peak in summer, and then cools down in fall and winter. This cycle of seasonal changes determines where the bass will be located in a lake. It also affects their behavior. So to be a successful angler, I have to understand how the seasons affect largemouth bass. To deal with seasonal changes, we developed the in-fisherman calendar of fish activity. It works for all game fish in natural lakes. In this case, we're talking about largemouth bass. Our calendar divides the year up into periods. Each period corresponds with certain lake conditions. Because our calendar is natural, the dates of each period will change from lake to lake and from year to year. The calendar helps me interpret what I observe on a lake. Water temperature, growth of cover in a lake, 
These are natural signs. All those things give us clues about where the bass will be located and how we should fish for them. In the pre-spawn period, the warmer temperatures in the shallows draw bass out of their deep, cold water haunts. During the spawn period, bass concentrate in good nest building areas. The growing amount of weed cover in a lake causes the fish to disperse during the post-spawn period. And during pre-summer, there are groups of bass now located at all depths, down to the deeper water drop-offs. Summer peak is a short period when the lake explodes with activity. There is a tremendous bite along the outer edges of weed lines. In summer, groups of bass tend to settle down and remain in specific locations. Patterns of activity appear, disrupted by day-to-day -day changes in the weather. Post-summer begins when cold nights start to kill off the cover in the lake. Bass remain in the shallows, flats, and deep weeds, but there is a pronounced shift to shallow cover. Because of falling temperatures and mixing of water layers, there is almost no fish activity during the turnover period. But when the cold water period is in full swing, the action returns to the outer fringes of the flats and in deep water locations where there are remnants of green cover. During the pre-summer, summer peak, and summer periods, cover is the key factor that determines the bass locations. Coming out of post-spawn, going into pre-summer, there'll be bass in shallow water, there'll be bass out on the flats, and some bass will be starting to make use of the drop-offs. During this period, you have lots of small groups of fish doing a lot of roaming. They're not holding up in one area for any prolonged period of time. Shortly after this, the water warms up just a little bit more, and we get into what we call the summer peak. Fishing can be explosive. The weeds are grown up as thick as they're gonna be all over the lake for the rest of the year. And it's at this time that you still got bass in shallow water. You always got some fish using the flats. But I'll tell you what, you get a heavy, heavy concentration of fish on a drop-off. It's one of the best deep water bites you're gonna get for the season. But this is a short period of time, seven to 10 days at a max. Then we go to another transition stage, summer. The water will warm up into the 70s, upper 70s, 75, 76, 77 out in the main lake. Again, we will always have some fish in the shallows and they'll turn on a bite, be active under certain conditions that we'll be talking about. There'll always be some fish on the flats, always some fish using the drop-offs, the base of the drop-offs, some high on the weeds some at mid-level down on the weed lines, again, depending on conditions. And for the first time, you start to get use on deep sunken islands. The last areas to develop weed growth are out on these main lake humps. And by the time summer rolls around, some pretty good schools of fish end up out there. Lily pads are well known as one of the best kinds of shallow water cover. Large pads make better cover than small ones, and the thicker the cover, the better. Although it looks impenetrable on the surface, the overhead cover of lily pads creates ideal habitat for an ambush predator like the bass. The best edges to look for are areas of open water next to the thickest pads. These are the ambush points where bass will be waiting for schools of bait fish. But don't pass up the junk weeds, thick, grassy, tangled cover in shallow water. Bait fish and bass use the pockets and holes in this kind of cover too. Reeds are another important shallow water location. They provide a physical edge for the bass to relate to and shade edges from which to ambush food. Thick clumps of reeds create the edges that concentrate groups of bass. This kind of reed location has many different edges, including the edge between the reeds and the lily pads and the edges between open water and the lily pads and reeds. But not all reeds are good. Sparse growth like this will not attract and hold bass because there are no distinct edges for them to use. A few bass may briefly use a location like this during low light conditions, but it is definitely a low percentage spot. In the summer, shallow water areas like this that have heavy cover hold some of the biggest bass in the lake. They're easy to find, you can see them. They're hard to fish because of the cover. Right now, let's move a little further out in the lake, the area we call the flats 
where most of the bass spend most of their time. Weeds on the flats create a rich, varied environment that holds an abundance of food and ambush points. Too much lushness can work against you. An ideal flat has pockets like these that form edges to concentrate the bass. These little areas of more open water enable you to make a presentation to the fish more efficiently. How do you find a flat with those kinds of pockets? Sometimes, in clear water, you can see them from the surface. But when you're searching for these flats at high speed, your depth finder reading is most useful. The alternating readings of high, thick weeds and open areas indicates the kinds of pockets that attract fish. You know, the shape of a flat can make a big difference in how many fish use it and how often they use it. An ideal flat would be something like this. This is a perfect structural piece. A big point goes way out in the lake, drops off into deep water. You've got a good inside corner here with a sharp drop off that pushes up against the weed line. I got rocks on a point that taper way down in deep water. I've got another inside point over here. The living space on top can hold a big school of bass all year long. A lot of heavy cover on it. A point that would nowhere near be as productive as this would be something like this. A lot thinner area of weeds. There's not enough living space to hold a lot of bass for any prolonged period of time. Size is the big thing to remember. The bigger the flat, the more fish it holds more often. When the fish are active, they'll gather out on a points like this, stable weather conditions. If you get cold fronts, a lot of boat traffic, water skiers, the fish will dip into the corners and tuck down tight to the edge of the weed line. Fishing gets a little more difficult. Another thing to look for on flats, and this doesn't happen too often, is depressions or holes like this. Usually, the outside edges, kind of like a reverse point, is where the fish will congregate into. You move out into the lake proper, and here we got a sunken island. In this case, it's shallow enough to have weed growth over the top of it. Earlier in the season, these sunken islands don't hold any amount of fish. You have to wait till it gets warm enough for cover to develop on top. In this case, we're talking about weeds. Good areas throughout the summer. Now let's take a look at one of my favorite places. On this end of the lake, we show deep tufts of weeds way out on the end of the weed line. These areas attract some of the biggest bass on a drop off in the summer months. These fish aren't affected by changing weather conditions, boat traffic. It's a more stable spot to fish. In deeper water, there is just enough light for cover to grow, but not enough light to make it grow all the way to the surface. In clear lakes, there can be good mats of weeds in 20 feet of water. Generally, this location is in about 12 to 15 feet of water, just outside the weed line. A sharp bottom drop-off adds to the edge effect and concentrates more bass in this location. In this location, the depth finder becomes your eyes. Watch the flasher as Al runs his boat in from very deep water toward shore. The flasher mark starts out narrow, indicating the hard bottom with little or no weed growth. Then the flasher mark really widens out, indicating the mats of weeds on the bottom. That's where Al wants to fish. Remember, to get an accurate reading, the depth finder sensitivity must be set high. Don't turn it down to get rid of the second bottom echo. Now we've been working with the idea that Little Lake X has cover from the shallow water out on the flats all the way to the drop off where we're talking about a weed line. Now there's a lot of stained water lakes where the weeds don't grow in deep water, let's say in 12 or 15 feet. What you have in those conditions is what is termed a receding weed line. All it means is the weeds don't grow all the way out to the drop off. In conditions like this, the bass will make heavy use of the shallow water cover if it's there, they'll use the cover on the flats if it's there, and there'll still be schools of fish on these drop-off areas, and a little thing like a pile of rocks could put a whole bunch of fish concentrated right on that edge, but the edges will not hold fish consistently. Now I've shown you the locations that bass use in natural lakes. There's usually some fish in the shallow water, there's some fish out on the flats, and there's some fish on the drop-offs if there's cover in all these areas. What happens if you get out on a lake and most of the shallow water doesn't have good cover? A few tufts of lily pads here, some sparse reeds over here. You motor out on a flats and there's a few scattered clumps of weeds. 
Near the drop off, you get a good weed line that starts at eight feet and runs down to 15. Obviously, the fish are going to be using the deep water areas. You're not going to get a lot of fish up in the shallows or out on the flats. Always keep an open mind. Analyze the situations you're faced with. Concentrate in the high percentage areas, usually where the most cover is. In this chapter, we've shown you the types of summertime cover that bass use in shallow water, the flats, and deep water locations. In the next chapter, we'll show you how short-term changes in the lake environment can affect bass movement and activity levels. In this chapter, Al will describe how changes in the lake environment can affect the bass's mood and activity level during the summer periods. To catch fish consistently, I have to understand how the conditions in a lake affect their overall behavior. Conditions like temperature, light, weather changes, human factors like recreation out on the water. Before I get into specifics, I want to review the strike zone concept that we had talked about earlier in this series. No doubt about it, bass are fascinating creatures. You could easily spend a lifetime studying bass and their different behaviors. But as anglers, we're mainly concerned with one type of behavior, why bass strike lures, and how we can get them to do it more often. You know, there's a lot of theories why a bass hits lures. Anger, hunger, curiosity, size, color, action, the list goes on and on. But we gotta be careful. Bass don't think or feel like we do. They simply react. They do what they have to do. Our experiences out on a lake can tell us a lot about bass striking lures. Some days the bass seem to hit just about anything. They're aggressive. They chase after fast moving lures and they hit hard. Other days the bass are just turned off. It seems like you need to drop a lure right on their nose to get a strike. We can take observations like these and turn them into a clear, simple theory about bass behavior. One that helps us develop a strategy for catching bass consistently. That theory is called the strike zone concept. It's really a simple idea. What it amounts to is there's an area around the bass that if you make the right presentations with the right lure, he's going to hit it. Now the size of that area is determined by the fish's activity. When they're aggressive, active, that strike zone is pretty big. Fishing's easy. When they're not aggressive, inactive, that strike zone is real restricted. Fishing's tough. It's just that simple. Now this is where the strike zone concepts really come into play. Let's assume that the fish have been active. That means that that strike zone is big. The fish are aggressive, they'll run down most horizontal baits. And that's the key thing to remember, horizontal baits. Baits like this spinner bait, or let's say a crankbait. I could take this crankbait, and if I get it within this strike zone, the odds are this bass will run it down, and I'm gonna catch a fish. Now let's assume a cold front comes through, something that causes a negative effect. That bass's strike zone is gonna get smaller. If I crank this bait out here like this, he's not gonna chase it down calls for a change in presentation. You need a slower moving bait, something that's fished vertical, like a slip rig plastic worm, or a jig and eel, or a jig worm. The bass will not chase a far out bait. He's kind of restricted in a key area. That strike zone is very, very small. This vertical presentation has to fall right in front of him. It's almost got to hit him on the nose to get a triggering response out of him. Now let's take a closer look at the bass in Little Lake X and see how these key summer factors, light, weather, and human pressure, affect the bass in the shallow water, the bass out on the flats, and the bass down in deep water. Light levels can affect bass in all locations. It actually determines how they position themselves and how active they can be. Let me show you what I mean. In shallow water areas, like a clump of lily pads, during low light, the fish will be on the outside edge of the pads near holes, an easy place to get to. During high sunlight, they'll tuck underneath the pads in heavy cover, difficult to make a presentation. You move out on a flats, during low light, the fish will ride high above the weeds. Again, it's easy to get a lure to them. During high direct sun, they sink down in the weeds, makes presentation difficult again. You move out on a weed line, and during low light, the fish will be out on the outside edges, fairly aggressive, easy places to get lures to. This will give you a better idea on how sun can affect the bass's position. Let's pretend the sun is here, and that's a sun ray. This side of the weed line will be shaded. 
the fish will move further out on the edges and be very active. I can catch these fish. Directly across the lake, in another weed line, the sun is penetrating right in there. These fish suck up into the weeds. Presentation is difficult. The fish aren't active. Fishing's tough. Light is something most fishermen don't pay as much attention to as they should. Light and shade edges are factors affecting behavior that you can easily handle and often use to your own advantage. But human pressure on a lake is something you just have to cope with. Shoreline activities have virtually no effect on bass fishing. Heavy boat traffic over flats areas does tend to force bass down into the weeds, but studies show that it does not chase the bass out of a location. However, a lot of angling pressure, like a weekend tournament, can decrease activity levels. The strike zones of bass that have been heavily fished become a lot smaller for a couple of days. Weather changes can have a major impact on bass fishing in the summer, much more so than in early spring and late fall. Any kind of weather instability, especially the notorious cold front, will put the bass down in the shallow water and on the flats. They'll practically bury their heads in the thickest weeds. Strike zones become so small that to get a bite, you need to drop a worm right on the bass's nose. But the bass in deeper water will be less affected by weather changes, especially if the water is slightly stained. In many cases, these bass will remain active when the shallow water and flats bite is totally turned off. Cold fronts, human pressure. If I want to spend a lot of time on the water, I have to live with these things. But there are ways to adapt. I have to fish harder, smarter, for less. But there's still a lot of fish to be had. In this chapter, we've shown you the most important environmental factors that can affect bass behavior in the summer periods. These factors, light, weather, and human pressure, work to make the bass more or less active in a given location. In the next chapter, you'll see how to interpret the location and behavior factors and make the right presentation. In this chapter, Al will demonstrate some first choice presentation techniques in key summer locations. I usually would start the morning off in a shallow water area with good cover, like this lily padded bay. I'd move from here to a section like this with a lot of bulrushes. Let's say I caught a couple of bass in each area. I'd motor across the lake, to another shallow protected area, in this case, a weed flat from one to three feet of water with tufts of weeds all over it. Let's say I get one or two more fish here, and as the sun starts to come up, the shallow water fish start to shut off. My next choice, a good flat. In this case, a flat on a major structural piece, a big flat, one that I can get the pulse of the fish activity fairly fast on. I'll start fan casting the whole top of the flat. If I make contact, one, two, or three fish, I'll assume that's a pretty good steady pattern. Motor across the lake to the next point, do the same thing on this flat. Catch another fish or two, I'd motor over to a flat area over here. As long as I was catching fish, I'd stay on that pattern. Slow down a little bit, it's time to go to the deep water. Like the weed line on this sunken island. See what the deep water fish activity is like. Hey, let's take these thought patterns and go out on the water. The sun is still low in the sky, and I think the shallow water bite will still be on. Let's go check it out. Man, this stuff is thick now. There's not much open water left between the pads. That's why my first choice lure is a weedless spoon dressed with a rubber skirt. I can skip the spoon over the pads and let it fall down in the holes. The skirt really adds to the wobbling action of the spoon. To fish more efficiently, I place my cast so I can bring the lure back over three or four good holes instead of just one or two. With a faster lure like a spoon, I can find out right away if there's any active bass in a shallow cover. But the trade-off on a fast lure is that I often miss a lot of fish. If I do make contact, then I switch to something slower like this frog. I'll go right back to where I missed that fish on a spoon. I try to land the frog on a lily pad and then just twitch it off 
giving it a lifelike motion. I have to use heavy tackle in this kind of cover. 20 pound test line and a flipping stick for extra leverage. I want to get that bass up and out of the cover fast. Well, I'll tell you what, the old frog trick rarely, rarely misses. You come in shallow water pad areas like this with a spoon, get a bunch of bass hitting behind that spoon and continually miss them, you pick up the frog, a slower presentation, throw it in those holes, and most of the time, you're gonna make contact. Hey, right now, let's go check out another shallow water area. Those shallow water junk weeds look almost unfishable, but there are some good fish in there. Because of that thick cover, you almost gotta use some kind of a topwater bait. Those clouds cut down the light so the bass will be more likely to strike something on the surface, a perfect condition for a buzz bait. When I cast, I look for darker spots in the water that indicate holes, open patches and cover. I use a simple, steady retrieve. The water is just barely calm enough for a buzz bait. Any more wind action and a bass are less likely to hit on the surface. A good buzz bait attracts the bass visually and it puts out a lot of noise, which I believe may play a role in triggering strikes. I'll tell you what, fishing buzz baits for bass has got to be one of the most exciting ways there is to catch largemouth bass, and under these conditions, it's definitely one of the most effective. You know, I can probably spend another 15, 20 minutes in here and catch three, four, five more fish, but right now I'd like to go to another shallow water condition and share with you another option that we have. On bright sunny days, the shade under boat docks really attracts bass but they're not hiding from the sun because it hurts their eyes. Bass are programmed to use shaded edges, and a dock creates the clearest, sharpest shade edge the bass can find. To fish a boat dock, I just flip a Texas rig worm into the shaded areas. The worm has to go into the shade, not the sunny side. I flip the worm in underhanded because I don't want it to land with a lot of impact. It should just drop quietly as close as possible to the dock. On cloudy days, the shade edge is gone, so there are a lot fewer bass under the docks. But on sunny days, you can sometimes pull several bass out of a spot like this. I'll tell you what, there's no bass on these docks right now, but that doesn't mean that there won't be bass on it later today or, in fact, maybe tomorrow. In fact, you definitely fish boat docks like this on any bright, sunny afternoon. Anything that offers overhead cover that creates shade should always be checked out fast. Right now, we're going to head down the lake and fish another shallow water area, in this case, a reed bed. This is just a super reed bed. It has lots of thick clumps with open water between them. Those clumps form the edges that'll hold fish. In the summer, I always check out the reed beds, no matter what the conditions are. The 
fastest way to find the active bass in reeds is with a spinnerbait. I try to cast it in low and hard so the line doesn't lay over the top of the reeds. I bring it in with a steady, fairly fast retrieve, keeping it just below the surface. OK, now you tell me, where's the fish going to come out of? Right off the edge of the thickest clump of reeds, just where it was supposed to be. Now I go right back to that clump, because there could still be a few more bass there. I just keep on working my way around those clumps, casting the spinnerbait just to the edge or right into the reeds. When I make contact, I stay with the pattern. A spinnerbait through the clump of reeds. No use changing what works, at least until it stops working. Hey, remember, the main presentation principles, as far as bass fishing goes, is always try to pick a bait that you can fish fast and efficiently. You want to cover a lot of water quick. In this case, there's no quicker way to fish reed beds than with a spinner bait. It works, and you can move through them quick. If the fish were a little slow or I missed a lot of fish, I could go to a plastic worm or flip a jig and eel, something like that, and pick up a few more fish. Hey, right now, let's take these same principles fishing fast and efficiently, and move to a different location a little further out, the flats. I know exactly where those flats are because I fish this lake a lot. But if I didn't know the lake, well, I'd keep my eye on a depth finder. That's the depth we're looking for, seven and nine feet. But the cover's a little sparse here. We'll move in to find some thicker stuff. I've got a lot of choices for how to fish the flats. I know what the cover is like, and I know what the present conditions are. What I don't know is exactly how the fish are behaving right now. That's what I'll find out by searching for them. The most active bass will be up near the surface relating to the tops of the weeds. The fastest way to find them is with a topwater bait like a buzzbait. I blow on the props to make sure that they're turning freely. Then I start fan casting the area with a fast, steady retrieve. I've got to use some heavy tackle here because anything that comes up and grabs that buzz bait is going to head right back down in the cover. If weather conditions have been stable and there hasn't been a lot of boat traffic, I should get some action here. With this clear sky, the active bass probably aren't gonna strike on the surface. But the point is, I checked out the possibility real fast with a buzz bait. Now I'll switch to something a little slower, a spinner bait that I can swim just below the surface. I'm covering the same water I fished with the buzz bait, but now I'm searching for those active bass that just don't want to come all the way to the surface. With the single spinner bait, I have the option of letting it flutter down into the pockets or along the weed line at the edge of the flats. I can go deeper and also fish the less active fish.
Okay, we made some fish contact on the outside edge of this weed flat. In fact, I'm on a small point here with a big, massive clump of weeds on it. The fish came on its shaded side, the outside edge of the flat on a spinnerbait. This is the start of a pattern. If I go down the lake and find a like situation, more than likely I'm gonna make contact on a shaded side of a spot like that with the spinnerbait too. That's what is termed pattern fishing. When you're out on a sunny day like this, always keep the shade effect in mind. When you're fishing the sunny side of a drop-off like this, you're fishing the least aggressive fish in the system. When you're coming to the shaded edges, those are the most active fish. And after all, the key is putting the odds in your favor. You always want to fish the most active fish you can. Always concentrate on the shaded edges of any kind of drop-off. But let's say we've checked out the shaded edges and we still haven't made contact. Then it's time for a much slower presentation, a slip rig worm. I cast it 20, 25 feet from the boat. Not too far because I don't want to fight the fish through a lot of cover. I take up the slack to keep tension on a line. That's the only way I'll be able to detect a strike. I retrieve it slowly, jigging the rod to snap the worm off a weed and then let it fall again. I can feel it, tugging through the clumps, swimming through open water. In my mind, I can just see that worm falling through the thick weeds, popping up off the bottom, landing right in front of a big bass. You know, worm fishing is a more deliberate form of presentation. It's for those fish that aren't real aggressive or real active. You know, when fish are active, they'll run down baits, like a spinner bait, a buzz bait, or a crank bait. But when they're kind of in a neutral mood, not chasing, the worm is the answer. Worm catches fish everywhere. Shallow water, inside weed lines like this, in these pockets and holes, on a drop-offs. Speaking of drop-offs, let's go on a point down here with a good distinct weed line and try some drop-off fishing. Even though I know this lake, I still use the depth finder to pinpoint those drop-offs. That's because the flasher tells me more than just depth. We're starting to come out of deep water, 25 feet. 20 feet. This is a real sharp drop. And you see here where the band starts getting fuzzy and thick? That's the deep mats of weeds on the drop off. That's where they live when they live here. Those active bass will chase a crankbait. That's the fastest, most enjoyable way to catch them. You need a deep diving lure like this fat wrap to reach them. I fished a drop off by running the boat a few yards outside the weed line parallel to it. I cast the crankbait to where I figure the weed line is and then I retrieve the lure away from the weeds. I up my odds by fishing the lure perpendicular to the weed line instead of alongside of it. I hit the strike zones of active bass at both the top of the weed line and the drop off all in one cast. And I fished a shady side at a point which will always hold the most active bass. You know, deep water bass fishing is always fun. You get a chance to enjoy the fish. You can get some fight out of it. It's not like fishing uh, shallow water bass in heavy cover where you gotta use something like a flipping stick and 20 pound test line and just horse the fish out of it. There's really not that much fun to it. It's effective, but it isn't as much fun as drop off fishing. You know, most bass fishermen are afraid to go to deep water. It's a fact. 
You get deeper than 10 feet down, and most bass fishermen are lost. They don't know how to approach it. You learn to fish deep water effectively, and you're going to be a better bass angler for sure. Remember, in the summer, there's bass all over the lake doing different things at different times of the day. You've definitely got to build your versatility as an angler to deal with those hot, lazy days of summer. Oh, man, does that feel good. Whew. You know, by applying the principles in this mastery series, you're going to be catching more bass than ever before. Learn to put the principles of catch and release to use. It's important for the future of bass fishing for all of us. Hey, right now, I got a challenge for you. Let's go to another body of water and just see how much you learned. As you take the challenge, keep your finger on the pause button of your VCR and have your guidebook handy. The guidebook will give you more information about each challenge question along with the right answers. This is the exact same lake that we fished during the pre-spawn, post-spawn period, but man, has it changed. The weed growth is up all over the lake. In fact, it's the thickest it's gonna be for the entire fishing season. A sure sign that summer is here. You know, it's still kinda of early in the morning. Let's take a ride around the lake and look for some likely looking places to start fishing. In fact, I want you to pick out a spot that you think we should begin the day in. Here's a few lily pads along this grassy shore. This part of the lake really drops off fast, right down to 25 feet. How about this spot with pads and reeds? More lily pads? Ah, boat dock. Which location would you fish first? And more importantly, why? Pause or stop your VCR here and think about your answer. Then start your VCR again. My first choice would be this big shallow water bay with all the pads across it. They offer good overhead cover. Now the question is, do I just fan cast everywhere and make random casts, or do I concentrate my cast in key areas? Where would you place most of your effort? Would you go back and fish by the swampy shoreline, point A, or open pockets in the pads like point B? What about those really thick clumps like C? Maybe you'd want to go way over to where the lily pads end and the main lake open water begins, point D. Pause the VCR if you need more time. Now that you see the kind of cover we're dealing with, what would be your first choice of lures? Pause your VCR here and pick a lure. Also, think about why that would be the best lure. Well, my first choice of lures and definitely my best choice never produced a strike. Why? What do you think we should do next? What would you do in this situation? Why? Stop or pause your VCR while you think about it. Since we didn't make contact with any active fish in the shallow water, let's go try out the flats. You'll be thinking about what kind of presentation we should use.
You know, we got a couple of good first choice presentations for the flats, but each one is for a different situation. Given the choice or the conditions we're faced with today, which one of these would you choose? What conditions do you think Al is referring to? How would you fish in those conditions? There's a fish. Well, obviously, there's bass using the flats. That fish came real quick. Now, we know that these aren't the only fish moving today. There's other fish in deep water, too. Right now, let's take a run to some deep water areas and see if we can make contact there. Okay, we're fishing this big, long point here. It runs north and south with a good drop off on both ends. It's definitely a bright, sunny day. What do you think these fish are doing on this point? How would you go about fishing the point? What would be your choice of lures for the conditions we're faced with? How would you analyze these conditions? How would you fish this spot? Stop or pause your VCR while you put yourself in Al's place. In summer, we still follow the overall strategy of eliminating unproductive water fast. The thing to remember in the summer months, as far as presentation goes, you have to be real precise. The fish are relating to edges. In a shallow water, you can see these edges. They could be the uh, holes in lily pads, shaded side of boat docks. When you get out on a flats, it could be the inside of a weed line. It could be holes in the weeds. Now, when you get on a drop off, it's a different story. You have to use your depth finder to follow the drop off. The depth finder now becomes your eyes to the bottom. You feel the edges with your lure. You cast into the pockets and the, and the points in the weeds. These are where the most active fish will be. Remember, when you're on a water, don't go out with a preconceived notion and stick with it too long. If you're not putting fish in a boat, try something different, go to a different area. Keep an open mind. In the first program of this mastery series, we showed you the foundation of fishing knowledge. In a second program, we showed you how to apply this knowledge to spring conditions. In this program, we showed you how to apply this knowledge to summer situations. In the next program, we show you how to fish in fall. Big bass time. Hey, I really want to thank you for watching this program. And I suggest to get the most out of it, make use of your guidebook along with this video cassette. Hey, I'll see you on the water. Thank you.